All right, all right, all right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, finally, there are two women on the show and only me. This is the way I've always wanted it. Oh, no ooh. ugly other, you know, no monstrous, hideous male specimens. It's just two lovely girls and me. This is exactly the way I want to wake up every day. I, I heard the other day that I heard, heard the other day that um, the definition of um, man, oh God, a man she's mansplaining, a man mansplaining to another man, is a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's about right. I love the way you know, like. Okay, so so apparently the worst thing you could be is is like a, a white heterosexual male, right? Apparently that's the worst right. thing anyone could be in the whole world. Yeah. So I even saw this, I saw this warning they put up. I mean, it's a joke, but they put up this warning on a, on a BBC documentary. It's like, the BBC would like to warn any viewers that this episode contains straight, white, cis, heterosexual males. Um <laughs> For those who will be triggered, we just wanted to let you know in advance. <laughs> well, so, you know, so I we, never thought we, any we of start. us would get to it, Gareth. No, no. Right? Mm -hmm. Like to a place where people like you um, know. no longer have a voice in society because how dare you? How dare you use this platform well, and speak at us, Gareth? How dare you? It is other people's chances now. <laughs> well, no, right. So, so we we do. So, you know, at the last white uh, male meeting, I um I remember everybody <laughs> saying, I remember everybody saying, "Look, guys, there's nowhere else for us to do anything we want to do, so we'll have to start something new." And someone went, "What about a podcast?" And that's what we're doing now. So, <laughs> that's what it is. shame. Oh, that's <laughs> Sorry, Gary. All right. No, don't worry. Candice Mama is here and Leanne Mall, everybody. So your Monday morning is off to a good start. It's the 6th of February. Um, hey, isn't it meant to be the month of love? February with Valentine's Day is on the way next week, and, right? All that stuff. That. I'm so, yeah. so excited. I mean, aren't we just, Leanne? <laughs> wow. I mean, wow. Woo, woo. Yay, us. Um, you know, actually, Gareth, uh, I mean, uh, Speaking about ah, the month of people. love. <laughs> yeah. Speaking yes. of the month of love, I could not see anything more unloving than what I saw on TikTok just last night. And, you know, I, I enjoy TikTok's background noise to my sleep. And so I'm watching this video and a Reddit thread pops up. And this guy is basically asking. He's like, guys, I just won a substantial amount of money in the lottery. And he says, okay. and I know this money can change my life. And already I was like, okay, we're in for some trouble. Then he goes, I've been in a long-term relationship with my girlfriend. And uh -huh. since telling her that I won the money, uh, she feels as though I need to share my winnings. And he's like, would it be wrong for me to leave her and go start a new life? And I was just like, well, if this is not the way to start the month of love, I don't know what is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would be asking oh, yeah. the same thing. Oh, I mean, I know that that's, I know that's horrible, but she has no clue. Unless she paid half the ticket, she doesn't get half the money. Gareth. <laughs> Gareth. Mm -mm. You, uh, you see conversations no, no, no. like that? Mm. No, no, no. If, we, if we're going to play that strong independent woman game, then you go get your own ticket. Like if, if you know what? No, because yeah, we started this morning on a, on a like male, female, like uh, polar opposites game. Right. So, so let's carry it on. So if the guy bought the ticket and he won the money and he looks at his girlfriend now and he goes, I could probably do better with all this money. Then she's just going to accept that's, that's what's in it for her. Oh, well, no. this, this is, this is where I really she, you know what, you know what she has in her future from the law. She, she has poverty in her future. Ooh, oh. Ooh. Ooh. oh you mean you mean when someone's povo? Povo. Yeah, you povo. <laughs> but you benefited from your divorce. Where did you get half the money? Yeah, I got half his pension. <laughs> <laughs> I love how See. she 
she does that cute <laughs> thing where she covers her mouth. She's like, oops. <laughs> um, <laughs> because Leanne, actually what you're saying is exactly why I will always describe myself as single. And the men I date get so upset about it. And I'm like, sir, until mm. I've signed legal paperwork, I am a le like I'm an individual entity, mm. you an individual entity. I don't need people yeah. adding me on Instagram. I'm like, so we are not married. We are dating. I've seen what boyfriends do to their girlfriends. I've had many a boyfriend go behind their girlfriend's back and be like, I will leave her for you. I will. Just, just tell me. And I'm like, you guys have been dating for like four years. Like, sir, sir, you know, mm. so no, I agree with you. If it's not on paper, you are not mine. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I, th I think... Look, obviously, this guy's from the West Rand. Hey, the guy's going to break up with this girl. Obviously. I mean, like you, <laughs> like you, and, obviously. you and you and Ryan, our producer, you from the West Rand. I mean, that's how people behave. And in the West Rand, once you make your money, you get the fuck out of the West Rand, and you make sure that you take you take everything. You leave the girlfriend there because now it's time for you to get rid of your West Rand. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need the past holding you back. <laughs> Well, I mean, listen, uh, the, in South Africa, I think there is a, there's a common law rule that if you've been with someone for more than however many years, then technically they're entitled to half your stuff. Well, that's also a very tricky rule because I know my mother was in the situation where she was with my stepdad for a prolonged period of time. And we, we assumed, I won't lie, we were like, well, obviously you're going to take half. Um, no, 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 no. Apparently, especially when they're oh. rich, they get good lawyers. So, no, my mother took nothing. So, I was like, this oh. is why paperwork matters, ladies. Don't, don't listen to this hype. Like, if you've lived with him for so long, the law's on your side. The law ain't on your side. Just go sign the papers. Oh. So, no, Gareth, it's actually not as cut and dry as we'd like to think. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, you know what? Yeah. You're not automatically entitled to someone else's money, full stop. And you know yeah. who the worst offenders in this, in this are? Not women or men or any of that shit. It's the government. The government thinks it's entitled to half of everything you own. And, and they're yeah. not. They're not anymore. You know, so I was talking to someone over the weekend. They told me the following. So I, I know that, you know, no show will go unturned on, on cliffcentral.com without a, a, at least moaning about the government for five seconds. So here's today's moaning, and then we can move on to other things. Yeah. Um, so this, this person has a borehole. They have put in their own pump and filter and all of that shit. So they don't have to worry about blue water, for example, in Joburg. Um, then they've also got their own off-the-grid solar. So they've paid the full amount. They've got the full treatment. They can survive without ESCOM at all, right, for anything. Off the grid, it's yeah. Like off the grid, everything. Uh, they've also got... They pay for their own private rubbish removal. So they pay a guy with a bucky or whatever it is to come and collect the rubbish. So what do they need the, the municipality for? Their, their point is, I don't have to pay any tax to the municipality. I still pay my national tax because I have to. They'll arrest me. They'll take me away. Um, but he said, Why am I pay what am I paying the city council for? They don't do anything for me. And he's right. Like, what do they do? And then... Mm. You know, someone else in the conversation said, oh, no, no, but what about the roads? And she's like, no, no, hang on a second. I'll just get a four by four. Then I can drive on any roads, even dirt roads, even the potholes. I'll manage. I'll get one of those ones with the big monster wheels and I'll be fine. So don't tell me I need to pay for your roads either. And I suddenly thought, well, actually, look, she spent a huge amount of money now getting herself completely independent so she doesn't have to she doesn't have to give a shit what happens outside of her gate and that that attitude is definitely permeating and growing and it's not just rich whites in the suburbs this is how a lot of people in this country are feeling no really they're like well i want to make myself as independent of this incompetence as possible so i'm going to do that yeah. right yeah well it's so what, fair, right considering anybody, what's been going on if anybody in the comments knows kind of what what else would you be paying for because for example i'm paying the municipality here like four thousand rand and i don't know exactly what they're doing that's outside of 
water, electricity, you know. Maybe you can no, include I mean... sewage. <laughs> sewage is one. I don't know how you're going to do that on your own unless you dig a big septic tank, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, at this point, government should be paying me for... Right, for, <laughs> for putting, them, up, for putting up their crap. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like a... Okay, we're going to stay in this country and try to make it work. We're going to try and generate some income, which obviously you take a huge piece of. You should be paying me some of that back for putting up with your mm. shit. Right. Well, Don't you think, guys? Well, you know, I feel like South Africa is like a bad boyfriend, right? It's like the lottery winner boyfriend. Um, yes. Even though, like, every time you try to leave, make yourself independent, like, they always want something in return. They always come back. Yes. They pop up yes. in your DMs. They're sending fire flame emojis. They start making you yeah. feel guilty about the good old days. Remember what we overcame. We struggled uh -huh. together. We built this together. And you start believing the lies. You start believing yes. the lies. And then every time you give just a little bit, they want more. Like, it's like yeah. you give a finger, they want the whole hand. Like, that's just our government. No matter and how then, forgiving we are, they take more, you know? And then they, and they also beat you. They beat you. They beat yeah. you down. Your psyche, your mental health, your physical health. You're like, and then they start yeah. telling you, you don't look good anymore. You're like, no right. shit, Roger. No <laughs> shit. <laughs> no. Totally a it. toxic relationship. I mean. Toxic. Yeah. Right. It's right up. It's there for everyone to see. Absolutely. I, you know what? Spot on. So there we go. We figured it all out. It's an abusive relationship. That's what Tracy agrees. Um, okay. So then we have neighbors. This is TP. We have neighbors that have done the same. Then when they want to build a new house or add on, they get a big discount off their bill. Do they? Oh. You see, I need, I need to know how to get that. Yeah, that sounds... I, I know of that happening in other countries. It happens in Mauritius, for instance, and that's why you, there are just <laughs> tons of these unfinished houses because everyone's doing renovations. They're like adding another floor, but it's just kind of two walls, and those stay there for about five years. <clears throat> you get a discount. You know who the worst ones are? And Ricky's pointing this out, that, that if you try to emigrate – then they want to tax you as an immigrant as well. They want oh. to milk you even after you've gone. Now, that's happening in America. Apparently, th there's a proposal that if you leave California, which is a disaster of a state, like they've, they've, got, a, they've got a state government, like Banana Republic style. And Gavin Newsom, who's the governor of California, is just absolutely shit at everything. And there are homeless people injecting themselves in every street corner. And they've also got electricity problems and... The inner cities are just disaster zones. Like, it's amazing how badly they fucked up these beautiful cities like San Francisco. Anyway, now if you want to leave and move to a city or, or a state that actually works, they want to tax you when you've moved to that other state. They want to be like, no, no, but you came here, so we're entitled to some of your money from where you're going. I'm sorry. If that isn't like an admission that you have, you have totally fucked up, that you're not going to try and tax people who've left then I don't know what is. And our government tries to do that too. Crazy. All right. So Vyasin says, late morning, everyone. Hope the weekend was great. Is it a late morning? I think uh, anyone, anyone who's up like we are at 6 o'clock, all the people in the comments, everybody who's up and at him this morning, you're not late. You're the people who are keeping the economy going. Give yourself some. <laughs> right? There's the industrial old school you. That's it. There we go. <laughs> Um, the, Tracy, Tracy points out the SABC <laughs> yes. who this weekend, I don't know if you guys saw this headline, but they want to charge TV license fees for laptops, iPads, and computers. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, it's just every part of the country is just grasping at straws. It's mm -hmm. like, we don't want you to be happy. That's what the country's telling us. They're like, screw your happiness, your paycheck. Yeah. Like we want everything. Any right. kind I mean, wasn't it with ESCOM when people started uh, thinking about solar power? They're like, yeah, but you're going to have to still pay for the power you are not using. Mm. And it's like, how am I paying for a service I'm not using, sir? Like, make it make sense. Now that yes. SABC is like, yes. just by the way, just by the way, laptops and cell phones are going to now be charged. It's like, it doesn't yeah. matter how you say it, it's still bullshit. <laughs> like, you I, know, I, I wish they said it that, I wish they said it that kindly. I'm still on their books and 
uh, for, for my TV license. Um, and if the debit order doesn't go off for some reason, the, the letters I get, well, via email, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're the most like toxic email, uh, letters that I, that I receive out of anyone that I haven't paid. What and are they I'm like? Spitting we're coming, mad. We're going to come and get you. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, they send one like you missed your debit order or whatever. Um, you need to make you we're need coming. to make payment immediately. And then about two and a half hours later, our lawyers are on your path. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're, they're going to find you. Oh, my. They, they're like really so bitter and angry. Like, like Liam Neeson in the what's that movie? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, taken. taken. We will come and get you. We will take your children. We will burn your house down. We will fuck up your life. We will tell your employer. Everyone's going to die. Pay your SABC license fee, motherfucker. Yeah. Oh, my. That's what they're like. I actually, I actually did get crazy. scared once. They, they did win me over. And I oh, yeah. made a, di a direct, an EFT. But you give um, up way too you, easily. Yeah, you know me. I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm a little bit Can scared of, of the law. Candace. As you Leanne, should be, Leanne. <laughs> Leanne is the only, she's the only individual in Johannesburg who still pays her e-tolls. I mean, she, oh. got, she got one of those e-toll things in her car when everybody else was saying, ah, screw you, we're not paying. Leanne was like, like a good little citizen. She was the only person who went. Remember those Sanrel booths they used to have in the yeah, mall? Yeah. That, where, where that was once, and those people would sit there with nothing yeah. to do. <laughs> yes. And the only place in the whole of Johannesburg that ever had any business was the one lady who was sitting at the Sanrel e toll booth, and Leanne walked up. She's like, Hi, I'm here to find out how I can give you money that I don't want to give you, but you deserve. So just tell me where to sign. And then they signed I'll, her up. <laughs> I'll do you oh. one better. I actually went to the Sanrel offices. <laughs> Not just to the mall. Oh, God, I, I God. specifically drove to the San Mall oh, yeah. offices next to the highway. Oh. And I went and got an e-tag. But I'll have you know that I haven't paid it in about four years now. Um, oh. So now oh, it does, wow. instead of one beep when you go under the, the, doom of, the boom of gloom, um, it gives me two beeps telling me well, that then. I haven't paid. And I only, I, I only remembered oh. it the other day because I had to go to Pretoria. So I got double beat twice. Oh, my. Well, uh, yeah, Tracy says you must be so excited for all the ETOL rebates and reimbursements that they say are coming. <laughs> like you're going to get a single cent of that back. And you know uh, what, Leanne? Don't let us bully you into being a non-productive member of society. You do yeah. it for those of us who won't and <laughs> just won't. It's, you know, <laughs> it's out of pure fear. It's my upbringing. You know, if I did anything wrong, my mom would threaten me with my life. Um, oh wow! And to, to the point that I, I cry if I'm pulled over by a cop. Oh I'm no! Petrified. But I mean, you must be let go a lot then, because there's nothing South African cops hate more than tears, especially tears oh. from a woman. They are yeah, like, please just go, just go, please, please. <laughs> it's you are wasting our time. <laughs> It's more effective than a than a coke, I promise. Oh, hundred. I wouldn't know. <laughs> Again, when people talk about privilege, they leave these stories <laughs> out, and they really shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, privilege. I mean, there's, there's there's no man in South Africa can get away with crying and getting off scot free. Sorry. Oh, hundred percent. You, know, you know what? We take the privileges we can, Gareth, and we milk them. Well, at least I do. Yeah, like. I'm like, if I can like flirt all, or cry my way out, I will do it. <laughs> all of them. You get all of them. All right. So <laughs> there's lots to get into this morning. This is the weirdest story I've seen in a long time. And by the way, did everybody see all the stories about Chinese weather balloons? Uh, I it mean, was, could this be like was, the start of World War Three? honestly? No, well, I mean, here's the problem I have is that every single thing on my timelines on all the social media was just about Chinese weather balloons being shot down in America. So obviously yeah. you can tell I'm following millions of people who are all saying the same thing. Uh, so I think I've got to branch out and just, you know, expand my, my, my inputs on social media. Cause that's clearly taking me nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Your, your algorithms are a bit skewed there. 
Totally. But no, it was actually the same for me. Um, and, you know, yeah. I'm a Democrat, so. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah. it, it was, um, I, I initially thought, you know, this is a lot of hot air, excuse <coughs> the pun. But Waha. it turned out that, like, China's, you know, is really mad about this now. Um, oh, yeah. Oh. Wouldn't you be, though, way. Leanne? Like, I mean, if people are accusing you of potentially sending these crazy missiles into, you know, America or wherever it is. Um, I mean, I think I'd be pretty upset, too. If it was like, hey, we were just, you know, purveying the area. We were just like, you know, we were just testing this thing. And, if, and uh -uh. also, like, I think especially after the past three years, like, China's been getting a really bad PR, like, you know after the vid and all the other things. Yeah, I yeah, think that if China, if China so much as sent a fucking drone over my house, I would, I would blow it up. And I'm not the United States of America. Those people must just behave themselves. After you gave everybody COVID, you guys just shut up and keep quiet and maintain your fucking silence for a little while. I'm, I'm still, China must pay. And if they sent a weather balloon over, over, any other country and that country had any balls at all they'd shoot it down china sending yeah i mean that's, sending balloons that's the thing spy on people. how dare it's, they a, a lot of the Chinese international uh, community is, is standing up and saying if that was over our airspace we would have done exactly the same thing right. yeah i don't, I don't think not, you can take the risk do not give you know? the, not well, give the, just... the chinese government a single do not give them a ball hair of breathing room that that yeah. government needs to account for itself they owe everybody some explanations about bats and wet markets about wuhan's gain of function lab they owe us some explanations and until they've figured all of that out no special treatment for china yeah i but you know what it is i think especially because they didn't send out like an alert they didn't say what they were doing you know they just like were like hey let's just let's just see how this goes you know and i think that's the biggest problem that especially with its reputation right. you can't you can't just be like hey i'm going to pop up unexpected no no so you need to send a postcard oh. Let us know what you're doing before you get here, you know? Right. And they just, they well, need so to we, realize they're that kid now, you know? And we don't, we don't trust China. Nobody in the world should trust China. Uh, the only people who are dumb enough to do that are, you know, idiots like our government who think that China is like going to help them out of all of their troubles. And meanwhile, China, mm. China's just got a really good idea, a really good grasp of how like venal our politicians are. They're like, Oh, those guys, you just pay them off with some money. And that's exactly what you do. That's what China does. Anyway, so I saw the funniest thing. I don't know if you guys did as well, but I'm, I'm trying to get it to you know, appear on the screen here. But it's like a weather balloon. And then it says on it, weather baroon, totally not for spying. <laughs> so, that was oh, my God, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Where are baroon? Sorry, not for spying. <laughs> I'm, <clears throat> I'm just trying, you know. Uh, anyway, I don't care Ooh. if I upset China. Really. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're already spying on the US with TikTok, says Matthew, and that's quite right. Well, that's the thing. I well, mean, that's accurate. Um, so I, I now work with um, a, a journalistic corporation. Um, that's sort of very high up in, in, in the world of SANEF and, you know, South African National Editors Forum. So I have mm. to start being careful of um, what I use. So um, I'm doing their, so their digital marketing. And we've had mm -hmm. lots of talks about TikTok. Um, and there, yes. China has, and tech, well, TikTok has basically said out in the open, we are tracking journalists. Absolutely. We... We are on on your phone. We are in your contact book yep. on your phone. Um, we have access to everyone who's anyone on your phone. So, I mean, for any journalist or uh, person in media in South Africa, you, you actually have to be really careful of downloading TikTok. And a lot of yeah. people are getting like burner phones so that they can still be able to monitor TikTok that way. 
um, where you but don't have. Isn't that the, crazy, Leanne? Like, I mean, because I followed the whole TikTok bike dance, like, um, rhythm and how it was created and how it was launched and the fact that even in the uh, China that they regulate how TikTok is used and Bike Dance, the company that it owns TikTok um, and around mm -hmm. the world I think especially in the West I think we are so liberal with the information we give out right like you'll hear people oh, yeah. being like well I don't care like you know if they're gonna track me they're gonna track me anyway and I'm like, mm -hmm. if like information and personal information is going to be the new currency of the future. And if you are not aware of what you are giving out and what's being tracked on your phone, you are in big trouble. So I think for journalists, it's crazy. But I think for all of us, we should all be very conscious of the fact that we've got spyware essentially on our phone. Spot on. And if you read those terms of service, uh, you will be horrified. I mean, I... I, so I have the app, or had the app. I don't have it on my phone anymore. I've taken it off. But um, yeah, I, I don't have a, a TikTok account. So I just wanted to see what it was so that I could mm. understand what all the hype was, right? And then, you know, everybody was telling me, oh, no, you must sign up. It's great. It's really entertaining. You could follow. I mean, Leanne, you and I had this conversation. You were telling me about all the, yeah. all the cool people you could follow, about like organizing your pantry or whatever the fucking boring shit i'm into that no one else is you know and i kind of i i tried for a while but then i realized like no this thing this thing's just a time waster big time waster well also mm. gareth the fact that they incentivize you now like every time i've logged on to tiktok I've, probably for the last few weeks mm -hmm. um it will be like a hundred rand mm. for every person you um get to sign up like if the money fluctuates, sometimes it's like 180, 100, whatever. And so they are yeah. literally paying us to get more people onto the system, which should be raising red flags anyway. Mm. Gee. So yeah, have you, it's going to be actually a really... Um, no, you see, Gareth, no, the way you, you like at coffee. the moment I don't need the assistance, but as soon as I do, I am... I'm getting all the people for the spyware. Like, I'm not above it. Like, poverty does not look good on me, Gareth. So, <laughs> you're not if, you guys start getting TikTok, if you guys start getting TikTok mm. notifications from me, just know that the budget is no longer budgeting and I need the money. I'm like, download <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, so when that, that's happening, we know that Candace has run out of money. Uh, hey, Leanne, what happened to your camera? Did you spill water on it? I know I meant to mute instead of turning off the camera because it sounds like I'm going to the loo. Well, yeah, it does actually. Pour that. <laughs> I'm just making. I'm just right. putting my my gin mix together for the day. Um, do you guys do you guys worry about like because obviously you know there are those people who are paranoid about what information of theirs gets shared and who has access to their, I don't know, their residential address or their uh, ID number or any, obviously we should all be worried about that. There's, we talk about it often on the show. In fact, we've got, you know, Yaku has got his own show where they talk about cybersecurity a lot of the time. And it's, it's important to know this stuff, but like, what's the, would, what would get you to be super scared of this? If they found your Google search history, I mean, I don't even know. I don't even know if that would, if if they took yeah. my Google search mm -hmm. and they published it, I'd still be like, yes, there's some fucked up shit there, but I really don't care. Like, go ahead, you know, do your worst. Well, well, you know what, Gareth? I think it's more so the invasion of right. It's not. It's not the idea that yes, you know, whatever you've searched may not be whatever. Um, I think it's just the invasion of privacy. It's like someone, like I mean, my apartment. This is why the light keeps changing. I live in a glass cage in many ways. Beautiful glass cage, but it's glass. And um, and so like sometimes like you know I'll be looking outside and I'm like oh my god anyone could be looking at me in this moment and I actually uh -huh. don't care. I don't care. Now the issue then becomes. Like if that same person like came up to me on the street and is like, I see you every day. You see, that crosses the boundary. Like that's like, sir, I didn't need to know that information. Okay. okay. So it's, it's just, I think all of us are entitled to a level of privacy that, I, that it being published or people knowing certain aspects of your life, even though it's not bad or whatever, mm. it's just, it crosses the line, you know? So for me, I think it's more that than the information being published. 
It's kind of the feeling <clears throat> when you've when you've um, had a house break in, you know, where there's been this yes. invasion, uh, where yeah. you you don't really care so much about what's been taken, but you care about the fact that they were in your bedroom, you know, or in your space. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, to me, I, I sort of don't want them accessing my camera. Like, you know, when I'm checking the, 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 the feed mm -hmm. to make sure that everything's ready for the show the previous night and I'm walking around my house and my hair's a mess and I'm like, I, I couldn't care, you know, what I'm scratching wearing. Scratching balls. Scratching my balls. I don't want the camera on then. So I want to be able to switch this damn thing. I want to be able to close that thing off and not have to. And I mean, the one on my laptop, I, I don't ever use. So. Maybe I but should if put anyone, a, I mean, if someone saw me scratching under my boobs, it's a totally normal human thing to do. <laughs> I know, so again, but you like, know what? No, like the thing is, Leanne, like, I mean, we all know certain things are normal, right? Yeah. I mean, but then there's also a thing. <laughs> Leanne, you need to save that for OnlyFans, okay? You could make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> No, but there's a lot of things that all human beings do that you don't necessarily want the world to see, see. you know, mm -hmm. like it's like, yes, we all know we go to the bathroom. Yes, we all know we scratch or whatever the case is or we look <laughs> crazy. But like you don't need the world seeing that, you know, you're like, this is not the version of me that the world deserves to see. <laughs> you, know? you, you don't need it, but but it doesn't really like, again, if if that stuff ended up on the Internet, I'd be like, yeah, well, pfft. So what? Because again, once you've we've we've all shared stuff on this show, for example, um, I <laughs> I don't think there's a lot that we leave outside there in in you know hidden places or whatever. Oh, here on the show, we talk about all this stuff. So if someone had to try and like blackmail me or extort me, they're like, "Oh, we've got your Google search history." I'd be like. Go for it. Do you know what we talk about on the show every day? Are you insane? That's nothing compared to what we discussed here. And we do. We go, we go for all the crazy shit. Like, we've discussed all of this stuff before. I don't think anything there would be embarrassing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think to a large degree that is true. And I don't know, like Game of Thrones. I don't know if you've watched it, Gareth. But uh, there's mm -hmm. Tyrion Lannister. And he yeah. said, um, I think he said something along the lines of, always um, wear your truth like an armor so that no one can use it against you kind of thing. So there if you live in your truth, you tell the world already before yeah. things come out, then there's nothing people can really do to you. Right. Uh, Carl says, nothing better than an old tit scratch. That's, yeah. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, House Invasion SA has a massive country invasion, says DK. Yeah, so we know what it's like to have people you didn't want in your house. Again, we go back to the government. Uh, Peter says, I don't understand. I didn't take intelligence. It, it didn't take intelligence to know TikTok is a load of cod swallowed from the beginning. Well, okay, you figured it out before all of us. There's no need to boast about it, Peter, and make us feel dumb, all right? Son of a bitch. Listen, I still haven't broken up with TikTok. It's, it's going no. to be a hard one for me. Um, <clears throat> I'm still very much invested in the relationship. Um, I'm just kind okay. of being wary you know what? at the moment. Le Leanne, the fact that you can acknowledge it is the first step. <laughs> I am not at the acknowledgement step yet. I pretend that I've got a leash on it. I'm like, I don't even need it. I'm barely on it. Like, I'm good. Like, they barely take anything. I'm in denial. I'm completely in denial. Okay. So oh, you're listen, a step above me. Speaking of denial, I've got to ask you about this because I saw a huge, like, explosion of outrage on social media about this Robin Island silent disco. So the floor wow. is yours. Tell us what you know. Okay, so what do I know? I know that I was sent a pamphlet telling me about a silent disco in Cape Town. And I was like, you know what? Cape Town's for the hippies, so I'm good for a silent disco. Until I figured out it was on Robin Island. So to me, <laughs> I mean, I may not be, you know, the most conservative woman out there as you can tell. Um, but there is something that's a little jarring about the fact that we so many people, especially in South Africa, went to go struggle, you know, they were in prison, they were tortured, is now a space where people think it's appropriate to have a silent disco. And so for me, Gareth, honestly, it does not sit well with my soul. I'm like, it just goes to show you how desensitized we've become as South Africans. I think that to me was the biggest thing that kind of went through my head. Mm -mm. 
No, I, I, it's, it's absolutely, weird. when I saw it, I was actually outraged. And I really hope that the outrage spreads um, and that there are more people who, who are upset about it than there are people interested in going to a party like this. I mean, I mean, the, the, the language that they used was... It's the language, Leanne. It's, you know, but it just goes to show you. I mean, one of the things I know since, you know, back in the day uh, we first met Gareth, one of my biggest things was the biggest the service the government does is by not teaching South African history. I think the further uh -huh. we get removed from apartheid, like the more so you see how people are just so unaware and they so like, oh, well, yeah. it's just another place. You know, it was a prison. It was a historical site. But I think South Africa is one of the few places. I mean, I work a lot in Australia now, but they go above and beyond to protect certain lands. they like, you can't do this in this land because this was where the genocide happened. You can't do this. And I don't know why in South Africa we're not protecting certain sites. It's like, but also, I don't think any of us could have imagined a reality where someone would wake up one day and go, you know what's a good idea? Let's go party on Robben Island. I don't think any of us thought that would be a possibility. Like, we all just like, but wait, how? Like, who thought this was a... And the worst part is right. people are going. People are going. I'm really, I'm enjoying you two getting all upset and outraged about this because yeah. when I get upset about... No, no, no. I mean, for, for every single week of my broadcasting career, from as far back as I can remember, I get upset when, you know, like there's a revolution in 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 Tahrir square and the egyptian museum is next door with you know all those ancient egyptian antiquities i got upset when the buddhas of bamiyan were bombed by the the taliban in afghanistan i i get upset when people um don't treat our own museums i mean how, how many of our museums are even open in this country how many of our priceless libraries and collections of art are ever visited by ordinary people but then when it comes to a silent disco on Robin Island, suddenly a whole bunch of people are like, oh my God, this is so unacceptable. I'm outraged. But I've been, I've been banging this drum for a long time. And I've been I pretty know. much out there. on my own. And I know most people don't. Candace is so right. Nobody learns history. Nobody reads history. Nobody listens to stories from history. So don't give me this shit that you're all upset and offended now just because it's Robin Island. By the way, this government has been running Robben Island so badly that apparently yeah. the place is in an absolute state. So they don't even care. The people who are entrusted with looking after our natural and historical heritage don't yeah. give a shit. They're not looking after it. They're not tidying it up. They don't pick up the mess. They don't clean the place. They don't polish it. They don't make it look good for the tourists. So how can you expect like a whole bunch of drug addled hippies from Cape Town who are probably just looking for a good time and some escapism. How can you suddenly try and put all the blame on them when we all share a little piece of this blame? Everyone does. We do. And you know what, Gareth, I do agree with you. We, you know, when it was the protest thing, especially a few years ago, right, where we were completely like just killing the statues, the museums, the libraries, like a lot was going on. And I was actually still on the side of like outrage and like what the F, right? And so I just mm -hmm. think in South Africa, we've gotten into the rhythm of accommodating and dealing with bullshit. Like we are so okay with, I think it's also that slow decline. You know, we've had to deal with so much that people just don't have boundaries anymore. We are living in a very lawless land. And I think everyone is trying to see how far they can push it. And so it isn't really like I agree with you. It, it, you can't just be outraged about this one thing. You've got to be outraged yeah. holistically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had, <clears throat> who was it, Mutale on, on, on Friday. She's from Zambia. And I said, you know that you've hit the skids when people aren't angry about the power going off or the water being shut down, but they're thrilled when it comes back on. Then you know you're in trouble. <laughs> and the same thing here. Like, you know you're in trouble when people are up in arms about a silent disco on Robben Island, which may or may not do actual damage to the, the structure of any of the, the you know, important historical sites there. But the fact that it's so disrespectful, suddenly that gets people's attention. Meanwhile, all over South Africa, there are you know, little places in small towns that used to be sites of kind of historical importance and national heritage, all just completely gone to shit. I mean, have you ever seen 
the pictures of the supposed Winnie Mandela Museum in Brantford, the place that she went to when the apartheid government essentially exiled her within the country. I mean, it's a joke. It's a, it's a, it's a brick structure. The windows have been smashed out. The roof has been stolen. You know, the, 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 the sort of corrugated iron on the roof has been stolen to build shacks. And the place has got a big sign outside saying, the free state government welcomes you to the Winnie Mandigizela Mandela Brantford Museum. But there's nothing there. I mean, it would be, it's a ruin. It's a ruin. And this is in living memory. This is not like a ruin in like ancient Mesopotamia where it's a ruin because it's 5,000 years old. This is not even 50 years old and it's yeah. fucked. Fucked. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Look, I hear you. I, I just, my initial reaction and I haven't been able to change it since. I, I still feel the same way. Was just a, a, a feeling of sickness. Um, and again, I think it was a lot of it was because of the language they used. You know, it was all kind of made a joke of, like, don't don't worry if the weather's bad. There's a section we can take you to where the walls were really high. Um, <laughs> spoke, it's, yeah, it spoke about where the prisoners oh had no, no view. Um, oh, and, and it's protected from the weather. You know what I mean? It, it just goes, it goes too far. <laughs> okay, so... I mean, if you know, people have been having discos in churches in, in Europe, and the same amount of outrage that you're expressing now was, uh, was, was expressed then. They're like, oh, but there's this old abandoned church, and we'll have our party there. And then, you know, a bunch of Christians are like, hang on a second, this is like sacred ground to us. It may not be used anymore, but it's a, it's a church. You can't go and have a party or an orgy or a, you know, a, a, a drug taking episode in our church if you don't mind so this is like the anc's church robin island but i love the no, comments of course. and it's a it's a unesco the, site it's a heritage site for crying out loud. listen to, listen to these comments right and dogozo's joke obviously a lot of people here are joking because we've got smart people listening to us but listen dogozo says i'm kind of concerned that i didn't get an invite am i not cool enough uncle Potze says maybe the dj will play struggle songs uh, propaganda says, well, our party area, Hillbrow and the CBD, was turned into a prison. So why not? It's being neglected. Why not? And then uh, Dogoza throws in, I would love to party on that island. Yonda says, where is my invite? And why be upset about a silent disco? That place is already a silent ghost town. Maybe this will awaken the spirits of those who fought for the people and chase the government. <laughs> Carl says, what's the big deal? Just make sure they don't damage anything. It's revenue. Well, the thing is, they're, they're quite desperate for the revenue, which is why I think um, Robin Island itself has got involved in this and, and agreed to it. Um, because remember that COVID struck that revenue right down when trips were cancelled. Um, and also, I suppose, where's, where's the money gone that was supposed to be allocated to maintaining the site? Uh, yeah. No, it's been... Uh, wait. Um, no, it's been stolen. Uh, okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> did, did you guys notice? And Zuzile points this out. Um, Lily's Leaf is closed down, right? I mean, Lily's Leaf, the famous farm in Ravonia, where yeah. they arrested all those people. It was called the Ravonia Treason Trials because of where they were arrested. Um, closed. You can't go to Lily's Leaf anymore. So if you've got friends from overseas, and <clears throat> one of my my friends used to send people there all the time too, not open anymore. Sorry, they've run out of money. Why? Because the Department of Tourism, God alone knows what they do, except try to spend our money on Tottenham Hotspurs. Um, <laughs> they, they couldn't keep Lily's Leaf open. Unbelievable. Um, unbelievable. Candace, unbelief, unbelievable. leafable. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Candace has got some uh, connection issues, but we'll get through those ASAP. In the meantime, I want to get to, oh, there she is. I want to get Dr. Hanan on. It is time for It's Going to Be Okay with Dr. Hanan, renowned psychologist, head of the Anxiety and Trauma Clinic in Johannesburg. And because we have Candice with us today, we'd look into some of the... Uh, I know we've, we've kind of spoken about this a million times, Candice, so you may be bored with talking about it, but I think it's so important to get into it. I'm not bored with it. You, you are one of those people who could talk about it. Um, forgiveness is such an, an, an important thing, and so few people have the ability to do that to actually be able to forgive. And I thought we'd talk with Dr. Hanan about this this morning. 
it's not just for the people who are being forgiven, but for the people who are doing the forgiving. And, and maybe you can, you could just give us the, you know, the, the, the brief background, because I know you have told the story before on the show, but it's appropriate because Dr. Hanan is on as well. Hey, Doc, nice to see you. Nice to see you guys. How are you? Good. Good so morning. I, so I want, I want Candice to tell the story of kind of why forgiveness is such a central part of her life. And then I'd like to hear your comments, Doc, because I think there are lots of us who could benefit from that. Yeah. You know, um, Gareth, it's actually such a good segue, right? Speaking about silent discos on Robben Island and then going yeah. into my story. And I think the reason I'll always have a sentimental uh, relationship with the country and why I feel like we need to respect our histories, because when I was nine months old, unfortunately, my father was brutally murdered by an apartheid assassin by the name of Eugene de Kock. So many people right. will know Eugene as prime evil. He was sentenced to 212 years in prison. And fast forward to when I was 25 and I met Eugene in prison, I forgave him and I advocated for his parole. And that's really when my life changed because a lot of people were like, what are you doing? Why would you forgive this person? And why would you advocate for his parole? And I think that always comes back to what you just said, Gareth, which is I needed to set myself free because so often we think about forgiveness as being for the other person. I can't forgive you if you don't say I'm sorry. I can't forgive you if you don't do A, B, or C. Not remembering that we're the ones that suffer. The other person's not mm -hmm. thinking about you. The other person's not thinking about your suffering. You're the one that ends up suffering. That, that is, I mean, it's a, it's a summary, and we've spoken about it on this show before, and I've spoken to you many times about it, so I don't want it to look like we're just, you know, using you for your story again. But I think it's such a powerful story. And, I mean, Doc, you, you could probably comment on this and, and help us understand why it's such a big deal. And, you know, I meet people, Candice, um, who go around and they're still upset about someone who said something to them at high school. Or, you know, there's someone that they have a, a, a feud with, a family feud. Like there's someone in the family that they haven't spoken to in like 30 years. And they pride themselves on it. They're like, oh, I'll never talk to her, that bitch. I've got nothing in common with her and she must learn a lesson. And I'll keep ignoring her until the day I die. You know, Doc, we call them feribles, right? Um, what, 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 does that, what does that do to a person to, to hold on to all of that? Yeah, the holding on to resentment is, a, is an internal cancer that just keeps on growing and growing and growing. How many times on the, on the show have we spoken about the coin theory? And on a, on a high level, you know, we wake up with 100 coins in the day and you spend it where you wish. And once those coins are done, your body goes, good night. And you wake up the next morning with another hundred. The problem mm -hmm. is when you run out of coins at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and now you've got and nothing to give. And then you have to steal from somewhere else. You have to steal from your health and your resiliency and your relationship with your kids and your relationship with your partner and your sense of purpose and meaning in life and uh, hope for the future. So what a sense of resentment holding on is a waste of coins. You're spending so much energy trying to close a loop that cannot be closed, that you're wasting so much energy on something that yields no return on investment. And you're spending all this time. And if you think for one second that it's not affecting your health, your relationship with your loved ones, your relationship with your sense of purpose and meaning, and I said, hope for the future, well, you're mistaken. It's stealing away coins. And I always say to myself, because my kids are the most important things in my life, and I always ask myself, is it worth me investing my coins into a, and remembering that I'm going to steal it for my kids. And if it's worth it, then I will. But if it's not worth it, because obviously I'd rather invest my time and energy into my kids, and I do not waste time. That's why I don't waste time on forribles. I don't waste time on resentment. You just got to let it go. And there's a couple of things that you have to know and how to let it go. But letting go of resentment is probably the single most important thing that you can do for yourself. Never mind the other person. Because as Candace says, the other person has moved on. They're not dreaming about you. They're not thinking about you. They're not meditating over you. And when they are working hard at work, you're not part of their equation on a daily basis. It's you that carrying it. And imagine waking up every morning and carrying a 50-kilogram weight on your shoulder. How much more inefficient are you? And uh, swap that weight for emotional weight. So it is about letting go, for sure, for yourself. You said it's one of the most important things you can do for yourself. 
I mean, that's that's no, you know, you've given us lots of advice on the show here. You've explained this coin theory and all, all kinds of other things that have really helped me to figure out whether or not I should be putting energy into stuff. But what you just said now is enormous. It's like this is one of the biggest things you can do for yourself, if not the. Um, so when you hear Candace's story, and for those people who haven't ever heard it before, they must be sitting there going, oh, my God, that's that's huge. That's such a big deal. And it really is. Um, it takes... It doesn't take a superhuman, I mean, you won't say that you're superhuman, Candice, but it takes a hell of a lot of power and strength and personal, um, I would say, fortitude to be able to face someone who you know has killed your father and go, I forgive you. That's a massive deal. But you know what it is, Gareth, and this is how I refer to it. I always think of it as being selfish, actually. Like I needed to be selfish. I needed to pour into Mm -hmm. myself and holding on to that resentment was keeping me from living the life that I was destined to live. And I think that's what we don't account for. We think, oh, you know, by holding on to this, somehow energetically I'm punishing this other person when the only person you're Mm -hmm. punishing is truthfully yourself. And so I remember one thought that really changed my life was Eugene de Kock killed my father and now I'm letting him kill me too. And so by holding on to that, I was physically suffering. My life was suffering. And so that's what we don't get, that people get to kill us when we hold on to the resentment because it does manifest physically. It manifests in our physiology. I mean, I was getting sick. So there's so many things about resentment that I don't think we take into account. Sure. Uh, And you know, maybe it would be really useful for people to understand that Justice is a psychological necessity. That's how we've survived for 200,000 years. Human beings get along with each other when we play games, and games are based on rules. At the moment rules are broken, we feel a sense of injustice, and that triggers a deep, deep, deep sense of resentment in us. There's no human being on earth that is okay with injustice. If you're okay with injustice, then that means there's something wrong with you. So nobody is okay with the rules not being played fairly. And when the rules of the game are not being played fairly, that should trigger a sense of resentment. And then you, we all need to close that loop. And it's very important to define, and this is very important, when I deal with people that have had to deal with injustice, I always ask them, you define what forgiveness means for you. Because forgiveness doesn't have to mean what you did was okay for me. That doesn't have mm. to mean forgiveness. Forgiveness means I don't accept what you've done, but I'm letting it go for me. What you've done was still not okay, and it will never be okay. But I choose to invest my coins and energy into things that better me. As Ken was saying, being selfish, being selfful, investing into self-care. I let go of this, not for you, but I let go of this for me. Mm. Jeez. Uh, Leanne, all those grudges you hold, because we know I've, uh, there's so many. I mean, do you feel like really, really silly now because you've heard these stories of forgiveness and <laughs> no, of course, I, of course I do, um, but I, I do hold those grudges. You're right. Um, I still have the ex-husband, ex-lover, ex-friend grudge that I bear, um, mm. but I don't, I don't think about it every day. Um, there is still a lot of stuff I know I have to let go of, and I know it has. There has to be a process, um, and I, I think when you've been really badly hurt in life. You know, you can forget about it and block it out for as long as you want. Um, but inevitably, you have to go through the process of letting it go. So, um, so let me, but let me, you, let me but be you can very allow pra- yourself. To, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Leanne. I want to I wanna get very practical because it might be really helpful for you And on the process of letting go. Because people think that if you block it out, it always come back to bite you later on. So if I don't think about it, it's going to come back to bite me. And it's not true. And I want to give you an analogy. And this is a very powerful analogy on the process of forgiveness because it is a process. So imagine I invest a million rand into a Ponzi scheme and I lose it. So now I've lost a million rand. I feel a sense of resentment. I feel a sense of injustice. I've got two options. One, invest more into the Ponzi scheme and feel more resentful. Or how do I let go of this resentment? Well, listen to this. What if I took whatever coins I have left and invested into other businesses? Remember, I've lost a million rand. So now I invested into other businesses and I've got one rand profit. 10 rand profit, 100 rand profit from other businesses, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, 
Now I've got a billion bucks in our bank account. Once I have a billion bucks in our bank account, how do I feel about the million rand loss? It's irrelevant. The way we deal with loss is by investing into things that create value for us. The cost is time. You've got to let time do its thing. Time doesn't heal. It's what you do with that time that heals. But you've got to invest it into the right thing because if I keep on investing into the Ponzi scheme, into the open loop, I will never get over it. As a matter of fact, in 50 years' time, I will be worse. But if I invest my coins and energy into things that create a return on investment, my kids, my family, my health, my sense of purpose, my meaning, my future, the future version of myself, within time, I've got a billion bucks in my bank account. The loss has no meaning. I don't forget about it. I'm not okay with it, but it loses its emotional intensity. It is true, though, Doc, that we feel the pain of loss far more than we feel the joy of victory or of success. Yeah. Isn't that right? 100%. It's completely tied to survival. Hurt teaches us a lot more about survival than good ever does. And that's the reality of life. It's not, it's not cynical or bad or good. It is what it is, and we've got to work with it. Yeah. And I'll just say from my own experience, and I want to make sure that people understand that healing is not linear. So what's going to work for you may not work for me. What works for me may not work for you. However, for me, what I've had to figure out on my journey and on my path is that the things that I wasn't addressing and I was just suppressing and like keeping and shutting down when I think what Le uh, Leanne refers to about it coming back to bite you is you end up making decisions based on the wounding. So let's say it's a love relationship. So you did not address what happened in that relationship or you can't let go of that pain. What ends up happening is you choose partners that bring out that aspect of you and you're like, I can't trust, I don't, you know, all these things that you're now um, projecting onto this new partnership until you address that, I, that my previous partner did not make me feel good enough, therefore I do not feel good enough in love. So there's yeah. certain things for me that if you don't address it and you don't look at it and you don't accept it, that sometimes they continually repeat themselves in your life. Um, <clears throat> just quickly, because I'm almost at the opposite end of, like, I, I don't hold on to anything. And I think there's, a, there's an amount of that that's also dangerous um, because it, it kind of, it's almost like those people who they've hurt themselves, they cut their fingers so the nerves don't work anymore. So they don't even realize when they've burnt themselves. And mm -hmm. sometimes I won't understand at all why someone is upset with me uh, because I've forgotten about something that happened two weeks ago that they took very, very personally and that hurt them. There's, there's, a, there's a kind of a middle ground that's good too. So you forgive, but you also need to actually understand what other people are going through, which I struggle with sometimes. Yeah, um, you got to, you know, it's, um, it's not even a balance, but you've got to obviously invest into things that create value for you because the meaning and depth of it goes much, much deeper. Uh, if you don't, if you don't get hurt, that means you don't value. So you want to invest into things that create a return. Invest, and that means you value. That means it increases the meaning and the purpose of your life. But you certainly want to go and let go of things that don't add value. All right, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we've got time for this morning with Dr. Hanan. But it's always good to check in with you, Doc, and have an excellent week. Nice we'll hopefully see you, see you on Monday next week with a whole lot more. And um, thank you, Cam. Look forward thanks. To it. Sure. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Candice, for telling us that story. I, I know, you know, every time it's kind of like they're going to be, there's going to be someone who hasn't heard it before. I mean, Ryan here is saying big ups to Candice. He's our producer. There's some grudges I won't let go of. I find the forgiveness thing one of the hardest things to do. I think that's true for a lot of people. And yeah. it is inspiring beyond belief to hear about your story because it wasn't easy and it took a long time. But as you say, why punish yourself? Because that's all that's going to happen, right? Yeah, and also I think it's important for people to realize that forgiveness is a muscle, Gareth. Like you have to continue working it. Like, I mean, there have been certain things like I could forgive Eugene and then there was an ex-partner that took me like forever to forgive. So it, it mm. comes and it goes. It's not like a persistent, I'm not like in Zen mode all the time. <laughs> like you, you get forgiveness, you get forgiveness, yeah. everybody get forgiveness. Yeah. You know, it's still something I work on myself. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Google Let's says here, um, love you, Candice, Mama. And I couldn't agree Aww. more. All right. Candice is with us this morning. Leanne is with us this morning. We've got lots to talk about in the next hour. It's a busy, busy day here on cliffcentral.com. Don't go anywhere. We're also going to talk about the 
I don't know how we're going to cope, South Africa. I don't know how we're going to manage the deputy president, David Mabuza. He resigned. Uh, how are we going to make it through this week without the deputy president who's done so much for us? His list of achievements is so long that I don't know where we'll start. We've got to get into that and a whole lot more. Stick around, cliffcentral.com. It's just after 7 o'clock. Good morning. All right, it is all happening. Oh, Candace has moved outside. Look at that, and you can even hear. Yeah. <laughs> because the lighting was driving me insane, Gareth. I'm not going to lie. I was just like, the whole time, I was like, oh. So, yes, I'm giving you better lighting. Well, I mean, you have also got to say you dressed up for us this morning, which is most un unusual. I mean, normally, nobody could care less about dressing up for the show. <laughs> I try, Gareth. I'm trying to keep the group average high here. You know, I don't want to be yeah. that one where they're like, oh, oh Candace again. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Look, no, someone's got to lift the standard around here, you know. Yeah. Gareth exactly. always teases me about, like, not covering my shoulders. And this morning before we got on the call, he's like, you know, I can tell the weather's changing. I'm like, you know, Gareth, you know the weather's changing when women like me have to start covering up. Women built for the streets. Um <laughs> <laughs> and what did I say? I said, women like you? Women <laughs> like you? Sure. Okay. Well, guys, I got such bad news. Uh, over the weekend, David Mabuza, who's the deputy president of South Africa, he's, he's, he's handed in his resignation. And oh, I'm not sure that we were ready for this. I mean, this is like, you know, this is like Churchill abandoning Britain right in the summer of 1940, just before... You know the the Nazis start bombing the place. This is like, this is like um, 
It's like Harry yeah. leaving the royal family. It's like George Washington just deciding not to cross the Delaware and fight the English anymore and just like give up. I, I give up my farm. I give up my wooden teeth. Let the English just take it. You know, that's what it's like. It's really bad. I don't know how we're going to manage. It's really going to be a devastating time in the country's history, Gareth. Yes. And I think it's just fair we really acknowledge the depth of this loss to our country. Yes. I would like What's us to hold hands this morning. <laughs> say a little, let's just say a little prayer for South Africa in the absence of Didi Mabuza. I mean, it's going to be so difficult with a man who's done so much. You know, his, his list, I, I, I glibly said before we took a break that you know, his list of achievements is so long. He's done so much for us. Uh, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure Candace, you and Leanne would love to list some of those achievements. So please, you know, go ahead because you know, this is the time for us to take stock. Gareth, I want to start with all the incredible achievements, but I feel like the list is so long, it's overwhelming to my sensibilities. <laughs> um, so I will let Leanne take this one away because right. I am just overwhelmed okay. by the loss. Right, <laughs> and you have the honor of listing the tremendous life work of Didi Mabuza, Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa. Go ahead. Well, well I'll start by saying that these are really big shoes to fill. Um, and I think it's going to be uh, a real challenge for whoever takes up the position. Hats off to mm -hmm. them. They're about to mm -hmm. spend many coins during their day on filling um, Didi Mabuza's yes. shoes. Right. Um, and, Absolutely. you know, as, as for the list, I think that when someone has done this much, you can't put it down to a list on paper. It, it would just be trivializing the amazingness <laughs> that they've achieved. So I, I'd uh, rather just respect it and leave it unsaid. Okay, so you're also dodging it then, um, because I was really hoping someone would climb in there and maybe one of our listeners is willing to give the right amount of respect and 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 you know, credit where it's due. I mean, I'd, I'd really love someone. Here's Tracy. She's going to try. Uh, Didi has done so much for us. Probably the minister of the highest number, uh, highest amount of absenteeism. He also went to experience the Russian healthcare system on our behalf. Thank you, sir, for your service. That's a nice, that's a good place to start. Very it good. It wraps everything up nicely. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mm -hmm. think anything more needs to be said. I had messages, several messages from people on Instagram yesterday when I shared this devastating news, uh, a few of them said things like, I didn't even know we had a deputy president or, <laughs> or, or uh, what was he doing before he was deputy president or you know, did he have an office? Did he, did they, did they, did they give him some sharp pencils to sit with in his office? What, you know, what precisely did he do? I'm not sure I know the answer to those questions. Those are big questions that really it requires a lot of government um, commissions of inquiry to tell us about, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm afraid like we've got to move on, guys. We we can't, you know, we can't hold on to the memory of Didi Mabuza, and and I really feel that we paid him, we paid him the second highest salary in government for a good reason, didn't we? Don't yeah. we always? I mean, the amount of money we spend is always wonderful in this country. Mm. <laughs> Well, um, I, I'm going to look it up because I want to see whether, you know, Wikipedia, for example, is doing him justice this morning. Let's just see what they say about him on Wikipedia. David Dabede Didi Mabuza, born 1960, South African politician. I'm looking. He, Maybe it's further down. He's a teacher by training. Okay, so he, so all right, well, I, I, I'm sure he taught. All of us a lesson when he when he was deputy president. Our lesson being, you know, maybe you shouldn't just be throwing money at, at people and giving them positions. Anyway, uh, it's it, there's he's got a matric. Uh, his parents were farmers. Um, huh. He specialized in mathematics education. Can you believe that? Um, he was a principal of a school between 1989 and 1993. Um. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm still not. It's really all political from there on. There's not really too much else that's going on. He ingratiated himself with two successive provincial chairpersons of the ANC, 
Lies Mahlangu. Do you remember Lies Mahlangu? Yes. Remember he was the one who said, all politicians lie when they caught him with his hands in the till. He said, all of us lie. You can't just go after me. <laughs> Lies <laughs> Mahlangu. I think he's dead now, Lies Mahlangu. Anyway, uh, he, was, he was in Pumalanga Premier. He failed up. You know, if there's an inspiring story for anybody in Didi Mabuza's tale, it is that you can fail up. You don't have to always fail down. A lot of people think, you know, when you get fired from one job or you leave one job in disgrace because you've done nothing there, that, that you will automatically sink down the list. But that's not true. Didi Mabuza teaches us you can fail up from, you know, teacher to principal to premier of, of Mpumalanga to deputy president of the country. You can keep failing up. It's amazing. And now you realize that for the rest of his life, because he was deputy president of South Africa, he gets a blue light brigade. He gets state funding for where he lives. He gets a, a car. He gets probably his shopping done by us as well. He gets bodyguards for the rest of his life. He's going to keep costing us money. Um, which I, I'm happy to pay. I don't know about you guys, but I feel with his contribution, it's a good thing that we're paying. I mean, for. Gareth, it would be selfish of us to feel any other way. And, you know, it always makes me think how we always talking about the American dream, the American dream. But mm. what about the South African dream where you can do nothing and get everything? I think that is the dream I want to be a part of. He did take medical leave, as someone already pointed out, in Russia, where he remained for more than a month before he eventually came back to South Africa. Um, he said it was related to his alleged poisoning, but we never got confirmation of that. Uh, and when the DA asked him in the National Assembly whether he'd been poisoned, the question was disallowed. So we'll never find out for sure what happened there. Um, his motorcade had two separate car accidents. These are all the list of achievements. One was on the N1 in Midrant. Um, he was not in any of the vehicles at the time, but they were speeding just for fun, for a laugh. Ah, ha, ha, ha. They were practicing. And then, yeah. And then, skills shop. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there was a huge amount of cash stolen from his farmhouse in Pumalanga, which sounds a lot like the story of a president having all that cash stolen from his ranch, as they call it. Um, apparently, 14 million rand was stolen from Didi Mabuza's house. So he had 14 million rand stashed away in his farmhouse, which is near Barberton. Leanne, isn't that where you go on holiday sometimes, Hazy View? <laughs> it is. I have to admit, it's true. Oh, so did you steal the money? We, which, don't, don't answer now. Um, th there's, there's all kinds of stories about alleged political violence, alleged corruption, a lawsuit about, uh, against Matthews Poza. But that's all we could find, really. Um, he did establish the Didi Mabuza Foundation, whose priorities are education and the social upliftment of vulnerable groups, such as children, the elderly, and persons with disabilities. But whether or not the Didi Mabuza Foundation has actually done anything, Angaz. <laughs> Angaz. Sorry. He does have an enormous big house that he built in Nelspreit for himself. And most of his time as deputy president, he was using taxpayers' funds to fly to and from the house in Nelspreit so he could monitor its progress. So at least our money didn't go to waste. Okay. You, um, Tra Tracy, who we love on the show, has found some <laughs> really great information that I think you should read, Gareth. Oh, this is from Gazoogle which is uh, <clears throat> the ghetto version of Google. And they say, Dizzy Debede Didi Mabuza, born 25 August 1960, be a downtown African sucker whose ass has been deputy prezi of downtown Africa since February 2018. Praise be. Ooh, yeah. It is a weird oh, thing gosh. that all, all of these politicians, especially the high up ones, they tend to store a lot of cash money at their farms. So if the rest of us as good law-abiding South Africans could just get a list of all of the farms that all these important politicians have, and we could go there and get some of our money back, I feel like that would be a great place for us to start. I'm not saying we should actively encourage theft, but it no, does it sound... Should, it should be an organized uh, thing. I mean, um, I, I've got some family members who'd love to help, like my, my auntie, who could sit yes. there on a Sunday at the table... Yes, and and hand dish out cash. the money, yes. keep a list, you know? 
<sighs> doesn't anyway. need to be a whole looting thing. Look, how will we survive? Well, luckily for us, Paul Machatile is waiting in the wings, and apparently he is the guy who's going to take over. So very exciting stuff. We've got uh, Paul Machatile, who already has you know quite a lot more on his list of achievements than Didi Mabuza does. But that's not to say Didi Mabuza was a waste of time and space, and that we should really just put him in as a footnote of history because that's all he'll ever be. I'm not saying that. That's no, no. I mean, I would never I mean, say. I mean, it would never. Who would, Gareth? I mean, it would be spitting in the face of greatness if you said something like that. So we would never. We would never. Yeah, Hello, we to criticize him. You know. All right, so now we've had our go at that. Uh, it's terrible, terrible news. When I heard the news yesterday, I was heartbroken, but what can we do? We must move on. We must be strong. We must, uh, we must stand together, boom, boom, and try to make things a little bit easier for everyone in this country, especially for the downtrodden. What did he say in his foundation? The, the vulnerable communities, the disabled, the old, the young, the poor. Let's think of them, how they're going to struggle on without Didi Mabuza there to hold their hands. Yeah. Almost brings a tear to my eye. <laughs> oh, it's very difficult. Oh, guys, I'm sorry. I'm so emotional. Oh, and you, uh, don't you don't worry, Gareth. Me. Paul is going to come and just sweep us away. Maybe the oh. last reserves of our finances too. But, you know, who are we I, as South Africans if not forgiving? I can only hope. All right. We do have to move on. Uh, so <laughs> uh, apparently... Leanne, this is the kind of shit that you find that no one else finds. It's one of the reasons we love having you on the show. Uh, six doctors swallowed Lego for science, and they've discovered important things. They swallowed Lego, and this is part of what they were doing as their research. Tell us all about this amazing research. This should really be sponsored <laughs> by the Didi Mabuza Foundation, but go ahead. Well, the reason why they did it is actually... Um to almost throw a spotlight on those very nervous parents, helicopter-type parents. Oh, yes. It, it's the thing, you know, kids putting Lego into their nostrils, their ears, or swallowing yes. Lego, um, yes. ending up in an emergency room. And these researchers wanted to show that it's not all that bad if you swallow Lego. So... In particular, they got together with a bunch of those Lego heads, the little yellow um, knobs with the faces on them, mm -hmm. um, and uh, said, well, <clears throat> let's, let's do it for, for, for science. And so they got together and swallowed a, a, a few of these Lego heads, these mm. um, pediatricians. One of the pediatricians, the guy who started it, Dr. Andy Tagg, when he was a toddler, he swallowed two Lego pieces that, that, that were stuck together. And that came from trying to bite them apart when they were really stuck. And the next thing he knew, it went down the hatch. Um, and there are a lot of very anxious parents who end up, you know, panicking about this. And he wanted to show that it's absolutely fine. It just passes through your stool within a day or two. So... He was wondering if he could spare all of these nervous parents from needless worry. Um, mm. And so he and these five pediatricians thought there was a good way to get this message out through science. Um, so they each swallowed a Lego head or two and basically wanted to see how long it took to swallow and then excrete this plastic toy. Um, the study included three criteria, a previous gastrointestinal surgery, the inability to ingest foreign objects, and an aversion to searching through fecal matter. Um, researchers then measured the time it took for these gulped Lego heads to be passed, and the time interval was given a found and retrieved time, or fart score. <laughs> <laughs> ah, all right. Um, um, this so is the, very interesting. <laughs> They eventually um, also wanted to raise awareness about a few types of objects that are hazardous to kids if swallowed. Um, one is those mm. little button batteries, those small little wafer-shaped batteries found in electronic toys. Those can actually burn through an esophagus in a couple of hours. So they did want to show that those are very dangerous, but very different from swallowing a coin or a Lego head. So we just want to thank these um, six 
pediatricians who <laughs> devoted their, their, their found and retrieved time, their fart scores um, to science by swallowing these heads to placate <clears throat> nervous parents all around the world. Leanne, we all know that Lego paid these people. None of them were doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Lego was going down on sales and they're like, we need some people to volunteer and we're going to give you a healthy settlement because nobody's trying to follow a Lego head. Okay, so we, they need to be honest with us. We love the research, but be honest. How much did you get paid to do this? Okay, because no, no. Lego are very clever in their marketing st strategies. I really wouldn't be surprised. Um. I can't believe that our best and brightest pediatricians are busy swallowing Lego in this <laughs> regard of research with fart scores. I mean, are they just taking the piss? This is almost like when the doctors were dancing during COVID. Do you remember? It's like, you guys are meant to be fixing stuff and helping people. You're dancing in the corridors of your hospital and singing If by John Lennon. I don't know. If I was a really nervous mom, um, I might actually go to the pediatrician who swallowed Lego to prove to me that it's absolutely fine. Well, good thing you're not a mum, hey, because if that was what you were spending your time doing. Well, that's the that only would... reason I'm not a mother. You know what? Your children would grow up to be deputy president. I'll tell you that much. If you eat enough Lego, everybody, if you eat enough Lego and some of it goes into your head instead of to your asshole, you'll become deputy president of South Africa one day. Can be assured of. <laughs> why do we have why do we have a deputy president? I'm sorry to be harping on this. I keep saying we're moving on, but we're not. I haven't let go. I'm I'm still dealing with this. Why do we need a deputy president? Isn't it what for? just for the sole purpose of standing in if something happens? Well, I mean, we, we had a deputy president for two days who was in who became a president, didn't he? Uh, uh, yes, Mango Sutu Putelezi was, was yeah. deputy president for like two days. But anyone can stand in, anyone who's in cabinet. So you could have the minister of justice or the minister of whatever. They could all stand in. We don't need this guy. He's got an office. He's got a blue light brigade. He's got a house in Cape Town and a house in Joburg and probably a couple of others as well. Um, he, he doesn't really have a job. He, there's an, remember, Cyril was deputy president during the Zuma years. He claims he was so unimportant that he didn't even know about all the Gupta stuff that was going on. So by his own admission, a deputy president's a dumb thing. Uh, before that, who did we have as deputy president? Oh, wait, Jacob Zuma, because he was so good as deputy president. Um, really, guys, I, I, I'm struggling to see the value here. Like someone show me the value that a deputy president brings what we could do with them. Well, there's more people to share your winnings with, Gareth. Like, you know, there's more people. Two heads are better than one when you're stealing. So I think sometimes you just need to run your ideas past the second brightest in command. And then uh, they can tell you where, you know, you're going to fall short and which part not to take from yet. So I, I think we're really undervaluing the importance of a deputy president. How much more, like, I mean, you want us to actually have money to run the country? Have you lost your mind? And um, so, no, I mean, let's not, you know, look down on the deputy president. They've got a very important role. All right. You, 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 make, you make very valid points. So here's something that's related to that, which you may be interested in. These are the requirements for the worst job in South Africa. Okay. Um, what is the worst job in South Africa? Anyone want to guess? Deputy president. No, that's the best job. <laughs> <laughs> All the reasons that we've just discussed. The worst job is to be the CEO of ESCOM. Oh, of course. Yes. So ESCOM actually published an ad for their new chief executive officer. They're actually advertising for this job. Okay, the group is looking for an experienced engineer and businessman with at least 15 years of management experience who can work with intelligence, discipline, and integrity and is able to address the small task of bringing stability to the ongoing energy crisis. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's what they want. This is what they say that you need. You need to have the following qualifications. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. A postgraduate degree in engineering or business administration, economics, or a suitable qualification at NQF level 8 with 480 credits. Does anyone know what that means? That's a lot. 
It's certainly not uh, just, you know, I have a lowly BA. That sounds like a lot of work. Right. So you don't have a you don't have a postgraduate degree in engineering, for example. Nope. Or okay, how about an undergraduate degree with an MBA or relevant postgraduate degree, which could be an advantage? How about that? Do you have that? No, not there. Completely unqualified so far. <laughs> no. Completely. <laughs> We're all out. We're all out. But here, you also need related experience of at least at least 15 to 20 years of senior management experience at executive committee level, ideally within emerging, uh, emerging markets. You need a strong commercial acumen with a successful track record in managing the strategic turnaround of a commercial entity operating within a complex environment with over 20,000 employees and annual turnover, turnover of 50. <laughs> there's no turnover of 50 billion. <laughs> now they're just lying. They're lying in their job application. A leader with unquestionable integrity and ethics. You know, maybe Didi Mabuza can just go from deputy president to CEO of ESCOM. Um, a demonstrable and sustainable track record of turning around commercially and operationally challenged institutions. Extensive experience in raising capital and managing large, ca large capital projects. And then they go into personal characteristics. This is the part I like the most. Must be a disciplined and goal-oriented professional with proven leadership experience at executive level, with personal integrity. Well, you need to be goal-oriented. You've got to stick to the the load shedding schedule with diligence. Right, right, right. Um, so, if anyone's interested, they actually advertised that job. And if you'd like the job, mm. please let us know. But that is what the uh, worst job in South Africa is, as per its own job. Wait, yeah. wait, it like isn't sorry, Eliane, but shouldn't you also be able to survive a couple of things? Because they forgot to tell you that you are constantly going to be on someone's hit list, like, <laughs> like trying to unalive you. So, yes. I mean, I think they left out a pretty important part of that job description. Like, in, when, you know, when, yes, immune to cyanide. I love what we did. When, when, <laughs> you're going to be immune to cyanide. Um, there is no <laughs> amount of money that you could pay me to take that job. No amount of what, money. What would you do if you woke up tomorrow morning and somehow you'd landed the job of ESCOM CEO and that was your job? You, you, your alarm went off, you needed you to get know. into the shower. And already know. I, I would resign immediately. I'd say there's no way I'm working in that nest of vipers. There's no way I'm working with government as the main stakeholder. I'm not getting involved in that shit. I'm out. I would rather be sweeping the street outside of ESCOM than working in the CEO's suite. Ooh. Truthfully, the only qualified person is our former deputy uh, you know, president because <laughs> he has dealt with all of this. He knows yes. the pressures of the job. He knows how to function in high-pressure situations. He is so immune to nonsense that, honestly, he's the only person I trust, Gareth. None of us. Yes. None of us are qualified. Didi, stop nonsense, Mabuza. That's his new name. That's his name. Did he stop nonsense? All right. Uh, if, if I come with my own bulletproof vest, do you think I stand a chance, says Stuart? Oof. I don't know. Uh, Let Lord says, you'd at least need to be able to take your own coffee to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to bring your own flask. Coffee will not be provided. George Meany, who is a CEO, says if he got that job, he'd just stay in bed. There's no point. Right, George? I agree with you. What the hell for? Um, I thought a criminal record was a prerequisite, says Steve. And producer Ryan says, so now they have job requirements? Why don't they give it to a cousin or something? It seems to be working everywhere else. <laughs> Good point. Absolutely. Spicy, right. spicy, Ryan. <laughs> uh, we've, we've really traversed a huge number of things this morning. We've gone Chinese spy balloon we've talked about uh, didi mabuza leaving we've spoken about the robin island silent disco which of course leanne and candace are lining up to go to um we're talking about swallowing lego but it's not quite over yet listen to this last week of course and the week before we had tigers loose in johannesburg remember i don't know if you heard about this candace but you've been living in like first world cape town but here in joburg we've got fucking tigers on the loose we got wild animals. So here in in my estate, there was a jackal. On there was a one of my neighbors 
photograph photographed a jackal wandering around uh, early on, on, I think it was Friday morning. How do you like them apples? Jeez. A jackal. I, yeah. I mean, in modern, in, in modern Gauteng, <laughs> this is happening. Yep. And but how wait, dangerous are but, those to humans? But wait, there's more. No, a jackal's not really dangerous to humans, but it might, you know, might eat someone's pets or something oh, yeah. like that. I mean, it's oh. a wild animal. Um, then I, I went to visit my parents over the weekend. My mother says there was a monkey, a, a vervet monkey, wandering around inside their complex. Now, I don't have evidence of this. I have evidence of the jackal. Someone took a picture of it. I don't know whether it's true, but a vervet monkey was in one of the trees outside my parents' house. Now, if the monkeys and the jackals and the tigers are all coming out, Gauteng is being reclaimed by the animals because we've, we've obviously, you know, now with all the load shedding and everything else, these animals are like, well, this place is not going to be long before it's all wild again. So we may yeah. as well re-enter, start taking back what's ours. It's quite something. It's all happening. I'm not, I'm not averse to that. I, I you know think, what? Uh, I, I'm me neither, place. Dan. I think I do. I think animal farmers onto something, you know, like the way we're running our own country. I'm like, let yeah. some animals come through. And you know what? <laughs> Maybe some of us aren't supposed to survive, Gareth. Maybe this is the Lord's way of clearing us out and saying, let us actually start over because we tried with a super flu that didn't do the thing. Let the animals go do what the animals need to do and let the strongest survive. You know what? If I must go, I will gladly go, Gareth, because the way the state of the world is looking, I'm happy if I've served my time. Yeah, this, this time we don't need humans on Noah's Ark. It can just be the animal's no. Ark. <laughs> no, well, you, you guys know. I mean, like it takes three points to plot a graph, right? So we've got, we had tiger one, tiger two. Now I had the jackal and then we've got the monkey. I mean, for me, the graph seems to indicate that the animals are coming to take their shit back. Yeah. So I'm okay with that. Amazing. Me too. Uh, so Someone says even the animals are fed up with the ANC. <laughs> um, there are genets. This is interesting. This is from um, gen genets or genets. Genets in the park suburbs. They've been known to be around for a long time. Genets yeah. are a kind of wild cat, um, and they're mostly nocturnal. But hell, if that's true, that's cool. Animals know that 1984 was a real thing happening now. They're the only free ones. There we go. Even the animals are protesting, says Uncle Potse. B says there was a monitor lizard in Edenvale. What a drama. It's wild out here. You see, we always used to laugh because when people in America would say, oh, my God, do you have wild animals in your streets? And we'd go like, ha, 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 no, you stupid American. We live in civilized, you know, South Africa. We've got streets and, and electricity and water and you know, shops and like we're not primitive we think i think we're walking around in loincloths and you know we have to look out for wild animals well yes actually yeah we are going to be back in loincloths and we are looking out for wild animals you you don't do that at your peril uh yonder says i grew up with baboons and penguins in cape town as part of normal everyday things and the former even used to come on paydays <laughs> 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 oh my god Ruth says I'd rather have all of this than all the anacondas in Florida Florida apparently there's a population explosion due to people having them as pets well Ryan our producer lives in Florida um, I wonder if he surely, is one of surely this is Florida in America no I think they're talking I think she's talking about Florida in the West Rand no, no Gareth please you know I come from the West Rand please don't do my people like this I know we're not the most sophisticated, but we try. Okay, we try. Uh, <laughs> Andis, according to Ryan, you should know in the West Rand, there are always a few African wild, wild African gray parrots on the loose. That's, that's true, right? It, it, you know what, Ryan? It is true, but I also don't appreciate you adding to this narrative about <laughs> the West Rand. Um, you know, coming from the West Rand, you appreciate so much more, Gareth. You appreciate... The fact that, you know, you can live with animals side by side. Um, and you also, you know what, you appreciate a little corruption here and there. You're like, who needs roads that function? You're like, you know what, everything everything is the way it should be. Yeah. So the West Ram prepares you for life, Gareth. Everyone should live there yeah. once in their life. Yeah. That's why you're I'm so calm. 
That's why you're so calm and serene right. about it. Everything uh, falling apart is that you go like, ah, oh, well, the West Rand prepared me for this. Dogoza says, I fight, oh. a, I, I fight a monkey on my balcony every second week. He has to fight them. Yes, us. And Tracy mentions a baboon on the loose in her neighborhood. I, I don't know which neighborhood you're in, Tracy, but I do remember there was one in Melville as well when I lived yeah. there. Um, I, I was like kind of herding my cats inside at one point. I was a bit afraid. Yeah. Baboons. <laughs> Bloody scary. Um, <clears throat> so apparently, according to Carl's, definitely referring to Florida in the USA with all the pythons and anacondas. George That's says... What I think. A Vusrant. They call it the Vusrant for a reason. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people in the in the West and the South who keep very strange pets, eh? Especially in the West Rand and the South Rand. Just yeah, saying. It's true. I, I it's had a friend true. growing up when I was when I was uh, schooled in the South. Um, I had a friend who had one mean, of everything. You went, you mean when you went to a place called a school in the South, but you. Yes. <laughs> Um, actually, I at attended a family friend lunch yesterday, and uh, I haven't seen them in years. And uh, a new member of the family kept, when I was telling my stories, kept saying, like, where did you go to school? Because, you know, it was it even a school? Um, so, yeah, on that note. But um, she had one of everything. She had a, a vervet monkey, a duck. Um, she had... Um, oh. Uh, a rat, what they call fancy rats. She had a fancy rat. Yeah, very strange and interesting pets. Well, can I ask what, how much melanin they had in their skin, Leanne? Because I know us melanin rich people don't get down <laughs> like that. We just but, don't. We don't play my, with nature. Nature doesn't play with us. <laughs> one of my favorite um, TikTok accounts is um, a, an older black man in America who's like, white women? They'll taste anything. He, there's a photograph of a woman in um, a Costco uh, parking lot stroking a wild moose. And he's like, you see, she's oh like, I'm going to put you in, my, in the boot of my car and take you to get you some marshmallows for lunch. <laughs> you know what, Leanne, I will tell you, um, white women are unafraid of things, eh? Like, they are actually the upper inshallah of humanity because they don't give a <laughs> F and they're so protected and they're so fearless. And, you know, for us as melanin rich women, we look at this in awe. I mean, even when they come and fight for our causes, they manage to take over them. They're like, wait, step aside, Jabulile, step aside. I'm going to speak for you. What you're doing to Jabulile is not right. Okay. And we are like, take over, Karen. We don't have the energy. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's very true. What, once we find uh, a cause we love, we're mm -hmm. in it. We'll fight you to the death. <laughs> to death. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right. So Signet, Signet says here, this is interesting, to impress a girl, depending on where in Joburg you're from. In the north, you have to have a luxury German car. In the east, you have to have a GTI with a loud exhaust. In the south, you need a city golf with a pound pound system. And in the west, you need a super bike. Is that about right? Yeah, that's. Pretty that's accurate. <laughs> uh, Little Kolo says, uh, oh, sorry, that monkey escaped from me. I was busy trying to create Muti. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. Sorry. All right. Well, Sharon says there's a TV series called Zoo where wild animals turn against humans. I love that. Someone sent me a video this weekend of um, a bunch of people somewhere i think it must have been zimbabwe or zambia or something and they're all at the river and they're like sitting on this crocodile and they're like going up to the crocodile and then of course the one woman goes a little bit too close and the crocodile turns around and like grabs her arm and you just hear everyone in the video going ah, woo, ah! and they scream and they like jump and they run and oh jesus and it becomes like a whole like it's just <laughs> <laughs> You're like, why are you people messing with a crocodile? Don't be stupid. Well, it, it reminds me of the seal attack video in Cape Town a few weeks ago. I don't know if you guys saw that, Gary. Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, you, oh. you literally hear oh. in the video, oh, my God, how cute. Oh, shit. Oh, 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 damn. <laughs> it's attacking. <laughs> you just see, like, people running for their lives. And I'm like, why do you antagonize this? And did you see that there were no brown people in the water? Because they saw the seal. They were like, I'm out. 
all the you know they were like oh my god how cute and yeah things went down I, I was I was that woman when I when I lived in Colk Bay t on one of the first days I was there I took a walk down to the dock and uh there were two seals lying I just look at a picture on my Instagram I think they were lying in like the shape of a heart a male and a female and it was so cute mm -hmm. And I was standing over them taking a photograph and the female suddenly, very suddenly, lashed her head back and went. <laughs> and I shat myself. I swear I nearly jumped off the dock into the water with the boats. <laughs> I'll yeah, never look, approach a seal again. Those things can be don't, really vicious. Don't mess with animals. Just leave them alone. They, <laughs> you know what, they, they, they didn't. They didn't ask to share this earth with us. And, you know, we always hear about human beings. You know, we've got to look after the planet and we've got this job to look after the animals and the plants and make sure everybody. Actually, earth will be fine if all the humans go extinct. Fine. And all the animals will be fine if we go extinct as well. They'll be perfectly happy. Thank you very much. We are the problem. We are the problem people. We are the problem creatures on earth. Anyway, uh, so now this is. What the what those white women lack in melanin, they double up on in Karenness. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Gareth, did you see that a video of the lion that was sedated but woke up as the vets were moving it? Hilarious. Ooh, ooh, ooh do me. I, don't, I haven't seen that video, but that must be scary. Imagine a lion waking up. You think it's been drugged, and then it wakes up. Carl says, uh, I'm half Lebanese and I grew up in the South. Some of my cousins make those vervet monkeys look tame. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um also like Lindy says Rottweilers in a secure estate that must be the mid that must be the West Rand. Yeah. Lots of uh, lots of criticism of the West Rand coming up this morning. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. We don't taking a beating. We we try not so to There's so much discrimination up. happening and I don't get it Gareth. I just don't. We good people. <laughs> We just have harsh circumstances that we try and navigate the best we can. <laughs> All right. Well, here is a list. I think this might amuse you of the worst baby names. All right. So this could be some fun. Worst baby names of the last year. Um, because obviously, obviously, we've started a brand new year. So um, these are the names you should not give your child. So I'll go through them if you can't see, if you're not on uh, on the YouTubes with us this morning. If you are on the YouTube with us this morning, then please like and subscribe and share the word. Tell everybody that you know, the people that you love and the people that you hate about the show so that they can all come and join us tomorrow. Hopefully, it'll make them more bearable in social situations. All right, so here are the names, the worst names of the last year. Boys' names, the worst names are Champ, I kid you not, Anus, <laughs> A N O U S, Abaddon, or would you say like Abaddon? A bad Aladdin. What, what, what would you say? Would you say Abaddon or Abaddon? Abaddon. I think it has to have like some sort of je ne sais quoi. Abaddon. Abaddon. Okay, Abaddon. <laughs> Spartacus. There are people who are calling their sons Spartacus. Spartacus. Yeah. Uh, Lucifer. No doubt, oh, that's one God. of the. Words. Can't give oh, your child. Lordy. Really, that's just an awful thing to do to your kid. I mean, he's never going to grow up to be anything important. You know, you never, no one ever reads out on the intercom. And could Lucifer please come to the office? Because Lucifer just got the certificate for being the best student in the school. Lu Lucifer van Blomenstein. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Jedi is another terrible name to give a child. Mm. Inspector. Inspector. With a, with a car, ne, 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 yeah. see any. Inspector. Imagine calling your child Inspector. Inspector van der Walt, will you please come to the principal's office? Uh, Ebola. That's a terrible name. I mean, name. I mean, I already know where Ebola came from in terms of who's naming their kids. And I hate to say it, but it's probably Upper Africans. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. But it's probably. I already know. <laughs> uh, Danger is a terrible name for a boy, and Cletus is the worst name of 2022. Cletus, mm. C L E T U S. I remember in The Simpsons, there was a character called Cletus Delroy, and Cletus yeah. was like the heck of The Simpsons. So, if you're calling your son Cletus, I think that's a very terrible name. Now, the girls. First one, 
Vajonica. <laughs> I mean, come on now. <laughs> come on now. <laughs> Not Veronica, but Vajonica. Maybelline, as in the cosmetics company. Mm. L'Oreal, as in the cosmetics company. Or if Chard- you're from Pretoria, L'Oreal. L'Oreal. And uh, Chardonnay, which, of course, is a kind oh, of Oh, I know. I know where that comes from, Gareth. That is... African American woman, I already know it because they like naming their kids after alcoholic beverages. There's yes. Hennessy, there's Champagne, now there's Chardonnay. I'm not shocked. <laughs> right. um, Elizabeth Breath, not Elizabeth, not Elizabeth, but Elizabeth Breath. Why would you call your child Elizabeth? Horrible. That's bad. Uh, Immunique, spelt I. Apostrophe M U N I Q U E Immunique. Mm. Okay. Uh, boom Queefer. <laughs> no, that, that's my favorite one on the list. Boom, boom Queefer. I think that is a great name. I don't know why it made the list of worst names. This should be on the best names list. Boom Queefer. I mean, if I have a, another pet, I'm naming it that. That's for sure. <laughs> ah, please do Maybe it. Please. Boom Queefer Mole. That's such a great name. Uh, Beverly, not Beverly, but Beverly. Uh, I, I didn't even know that was real, but there it is. Our Miracle is the second most popular name. Our Miracle, A H. Well, and then- I think you're saying it wrong, Gareth. It's supposed to be like a sigh of relief, like, ah, oh, miracle. You know, it has oh. to be said with emphasis. Oh, a miracle. A miracle. Uh, like, boom, it's like, oh, wow. Boom, quick. Why don't you go and fetch? <laughs> Well, boom, we go fetch your sister. Our miracle. We got to go Definitely to the shop. Definitely same family. Definitely same family. Our miracle, boom, Quifa and Chardonnay are 100% in the same family. I love, <laughs> I love it. And then the most popular, or rather the worst popular girl's name is Appaloosa, which is a terrible, terrible thing. I mean, it's a place, horse. It's a place in America. Um, but it's, a you know, to call your daughter Appaloosa. I mean, really, that's just very cruel. Very, loser very for short. Mm. So we often talk about how bad names just are the worst thing you can give your child, but it seems no one's listening. Uh, you know, here in South Africa, the one set of names, you know I keep a list, Leanne, of bad Afrikaans names. Oh, yes, you do. And I've been adding to it. Do you want to hear some of the new ones? Oh, yes. Please. Okay. Candice, you, you've never been uh, privy to this incredible list of cuck Afrikaans names. It, it's something I keep I'm on excited. my mind. Constantly updating. Look how long the list has become. It's it's just ages list. and ages. Long. All right. So <clears throat> here are some names that I've just added. Gretely, spelled <laughs> Gretel with an I. Stanis. Oh my gosh, that sounds like Stenise. an anti antihistamine tablet. Yep. Uh, Zante. That's mm-hmm. a that's a good one. Muriline, spelled M U R I L E N E. It should be M O E, Mur, Murlin. Uh, That's what I thought, Leanne. I was like, a yes, and the Murren, you know, yeah. like I thought it was in that play, in that vein. Uh, well, maybe, maybe you guys, are, maybe you're right. Um, Francel, that's a good name, oh. Francel. Um, Quansha, spelt with a Q. Q W. Now, remember, I only add the names to this list if, if you prove to me that they actually belong to someone. So you have to send me their, a picture of their. Their birth certificate, or their if they're estate agents on their board, you have to. Uh, otherwise, I don't add them. So these are real names. I'm not making it up. Chantalisa. If you spelled, if you took some of those um, American families that we were talking about earlier, who have like Bumshika and those sort of names, if you oh. give any of those an Afrikaans accent, it might work. Like Sorry. the one you've just said now. It is Bumquifa. All right, please okay. get it right. Boom, Bumquifa. <laughs> What's the name you said now? The one on your list? Uh, Francel. No. Oh, if, Quansha. Quansha. <laughs> See, Quansha. Could have been Quansha, but if you go Quansha. Yo, 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 go fetch Quansha. Where the hell Quansha? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, here's a good one. Zuzette, spelled Z O Z E T T E. Zuzette. It, every letter is repeated except the O. There are two Zs, there are two Ts, and there are two Es in Zuzet. That's beautiful. 
Um, here's another one. Yuvanka, spelt J-O-V-A-N-C-K-E. And there are two that have really made the, the top of my list recently. The one is Norlene, spelt N-A-U-L-E-N-E, which sounds like kind of when you're feeling sick, but you, there's, mm. there isn't a bathroom around for you to take a shit, and you know it's going to be a big diarrhea-filled one. Norlene, I'm feeling yeah. so naughty. You know? It's when you it's when you're nauseous at both ends. You're Norlene. Yes. You're Norlene. And then my favorite one, which I know you both gonna love to pieces, uh the, the latest addition to the list, Fakulane, spelt V A K K O L Y N. Fakulane. My goodness. You know, with all these names, all of a sudden I'm starting to feel a little broody. I'm like, <laughs> actually, maybe I should have some babies so that oh, I can nice. give no ifs about how they get bullied on the playground because these parents clearly did not give an if they were like you know because also is it like with a name you know you meet those people who try and like give you a nickname from your name all the time mm -hmm. what are you going to do like come here zuzu like i mean and like some of these names are just not user friendly they just not well well i'm i've decided that for the purposes of the rest of this morning's show which luckily for you two is only six minutes more i'm going to call you leanne boom Queefer. And Candace is going to be referred to as Fakulane. All right. So, so go ahead. You've got uh, last few minutes. What do you want to get off your chests? Uh, you can go first. Boom, Queefer. What do you want to say? I just, I just want to say that there's only one obvious shortening of Fakulane. <laughs> it's very unfortunate. But what would you say you know, that is? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, like I could be called Boom or Queefer. I w you know, I wouldn't mind. Uh, neither of those are too bad. But to be called fuck short for Fakulane is just a bit of a problem. How do we shorten your name, uh, Fakulane? Why don't you tell us? How do we shorten your uh, name? Uh, you know, uh, Ulane, Fuck, Fak. <laughs> um, you know, there's so many. I just think like when my parents were naming me, they were just so inspired by, you know, freedom. And they were like, Fuck you lane, man. Like, you know, wow, we are in it. The struggle is over. So I just think that my name should be respected. Like, you know, and fuck anyone who doesn't believe so. <laughs> so. <laughs> I love oh, it. All right. Very good. Now, uh, what are your plans for the week? Uh, boom, queef, a mole. What are you up to? Well, uh, fuck lane and I are actually spending the weekend together. We're, oh, nice. We're conducting a... A survey at a mall. It's it's going to be called the Boom Queefer Fucker Lane Survey. Um, yeah. uh, it's because we want to try to find. It, by the way. We want to try and help find um, a new um, ESCOM chief and also deputy mm. president. That's nice of you. You're helping the country. Yeah. Very good. Um, Always. Uh, so Tracy says, when my oldest was a toddler, he had a friend in his preschool class called Farki. Of course, toddlers can't pr can't pronounce the R, so Farki became Fucky. I thought my child was swearing. Shame. It's just terrible. Uh, no, but isn't Farki and maybe my Afrikaans data bundles have run out, but isn't that a pig? Yes. Like a little yes. Fark? Why yes. would you yeah. kill, call your kid a little piggy? I mean, well, pigs are cute and stuff, but I mean, come know, on now. I mean, as much as those are all horrible names, I do have to say there's some something charming that Afrikaans people do is they give their, their kids nicknames. And those nicknames often be, stay their nicknames for the rest of their lives. I mean, like you've heard of Dratkar de Lange and you've heard of uh, Langpit. And like they've all got yeah. funny names with a nickname attached to it. I kind of find that... Kortbroek. Yeah, yeah or like Puff. Or on Skalkweg. <laughs> yeah, he's a rugby player, right? I don't know if this is his name. He was the last. Puff Duplessis, but Puff is short for something. It's, it's uh, what I like is when they call them like uh, Bies. <laughs> like Bakura bak Boinkies or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or you know, Pastei van a Walt. <laughs> 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 BS. I like that one too. <laughs> so those are those are the names I like. So if anybody uh, has any of those, please feel free to supply them. I'll make another list. I, I've got this is the kind of shit that makes my life happy. I, I keep lists of shit names and great nicknames. So if you'd like to contribute, please bring it on. All right, everybody, have an excellent day, and thank you very much to Fakulane Mama in Cape Town and to um, Boom Queefer Mole here in Johannesburg. 
We will see you tomorrow at 6 a.m. bright and early. Have an excellent day in the company of cliffcentral.com. Be good. And if you're not, take photos. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye.